All right, it's good to see everybody here this morning. Look forward to our times of worship together. Let's take our chorus books and turn all the way to the back, and we'll sing this hymn complete in thee. No work of mine may take their Lord to place of thine. Thy blood, which blood shed unto death, hath pardoned, bought for me, and I am now complete in thee. Complete in thee, no work of mine may take, dear Lord, the place of thine. Thy blood hath pardoned and bought for me, and I am now complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh blessed God, and sanctified, salvation wrought. Thy blood hath hard and bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Complete in thee, no more shall sin. Thy grace hath conquered grace within. Thy voice shall bid the tempter flee, and I shall stand complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Complete in thee each want supply, and no good thing to me deny, since thou my portion, Lord, will be. I ask no more complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath barred and bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Dear Savior, when before thy bar all tribes and tongues assembled are, among thy chosen will I be, at thy right hand complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh blessed God, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned and bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Dear child of God, and were to sing your testimony before the Lord, that would be a good hymn to sing, wouldn't it? Complete in thee. Let's take our Bibles and look once again in Proverbs chapter 1. And I'm going to read from verse 1 down to verse 7. And we'll just see how far we get. It's important for me, just like in building a house, to lay a good foundation. If you find somebody that's a contractor and says, oh, don't worry about it, I can get that house built in a day and they show up and start putting up the walls, you're going to go, wait a minute. Isn't there something about pouring a foundation here that you do before you build the walls? And I say that because I believe it's vital, these introductory verses, to lay the foundation of what this book of Proverbs is all about. And we know that there is no other foundation that can be laid than that which has been laid, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. You can read through this entire book of Proverbs, but if all it is is a book of sayings or quotes, 
that you feel are going to help make you live better or feel better or be better, then you will have missed the very purpose of this book. A lot like when you read a book. How many of us take the time to read the preface? I used to just like to get over that and get right into it. But there's a reason there's a preface to a book, because in it, it lays out the roadmap for where that book is going. And you can learn some things in that preface of what to expect as you read. So that's what we're doing here. That's why I'm taking my time going through this. We looked primarily at verse 1 last time, where it says the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. We considered how Solomon was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. There wasn't any man, the scriptures say, wiser or wealthier on earth than Solomon. And yet when the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth and stood in front of that temple and all of those around him considered Solomon to be the greatest of kings, perhaps second to David, what did our Lord say? There's one here greater than Solomon. They had a tendency to exalt these men, whether it was Moses, whether it was Abraham, whether it was Solomon, whether it was David, and elevate them above measure when in reality they were but servants of God who came and served as a type and a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in their offices. So as we read here, let's keep this in mind, that this is about Christ. Now today we're going to consider what is it to have wisdom and understanding? What is it for Christ to be our wisdom? What is it for Christ to be our knowledge? What is it for Christ to be our understanding? And what's the connection between those three words that we find here? Let's read this and then we'll have a word of prayer. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels to understand a proverb and the interpretation. There it is. You can read some of these proverbs, but what is the interpretation? Notice one interpretation. The words of the wise, and there I have to say the words of the wise one, not Solomon but Christ in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found and their dark sayings, their hidden, mysterious sayings. It's not like dark in the sense of it's dark and obscure, but in the sense of hidden. How is it that any of us can know of Christ? It has, he has to be revealed. The dark sayings. And then verse seven, if you wonder how this all comes about, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And again, I would encourage you throughout the book of Proverbs, where you see wisdom and where you see understanding, put the name of Christ. Where you see the wise one, put the name of Christ. Where you see the righteous one, put Christ. So here, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the knowledge of not what, but who, the knowledge of Christ, the fear of the Lord. Where does that originate? It's not within us. Paul said there in Romans 3 that they have no fear of God. Those that are still without the knowledge of Christ, without the spirit of God, they have no fear. And that's pretty evident in society when you see people walking around in a store somewhere or passing you and says, no fear. They take that as a prideful thing. That's not a prideful thing. There ought to be fear, especially the fear of the Lord. 
There's no fear in religion. People run around today acting like they're God's children based upon some profession they made or some work that they're doing or ceremonies that they're going through, but no fear of God, even in their ignorance. And that's why verse seven says, fools despise wisdom. You could say fools despise Christ. They don't want to hear of him. They don't want to hear of his righteousness. They want. They don't want to hear of his work alone being that satisfaction before a holy God. They want some credit. And you know how that is in human nature, sinful nature. If you put on a play, but everybody gets recognized except for you, you're upset. I want my name mentioned, even if it is in the credit line. That's just our depraved nature. But I'll tell you, when it comes to Christ, the wisdom of God and the power of God, there is no sharing of glory. He has no rival. All that we are and have before God is in him, if we're his. Let's ask his blessing as we continue. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you would direct my heart and mind and thoughts that the words that Come forth, might be truly directed of you and uh, to your honor and glory alone. I thank you for these here gathered and those who are our extended congregation, family, over the internet, throughout the world. I'm thankful that we have a place where we can meet and hear of your son and exalt and glorify his name together. And so we pray for your blessing as we do so. And it's in our dear Savior's name I pray. Amen. So what is the difference between wisdom, knowledge, and understanding? If I were to give you an essay and say, just write a brief definition, you have to think a little bit, don't you? Because it sounds like they're all similar. Wisdom, knowledge, understanding, they're related. Yet these are words that we find here that are distinctive. And there's not one word of scripture that is just filler. As the Lord has taught me about this being the inspired word of God and every word being there for our instruction in righteousness, in God's righteousness, it causes you to slow down a little bit and consider the difference in the meaning. And that's where I'm thankful that today, even though I spent years studying the original Greek and Hebrew, you don't have to know Greek and Hebrew to understand the scriptures. As I've said before, the one thing I like about the authorized version, it was written at a sixth grade level. Now, if someone comes up to you and says, well, I don't get that old English, I always respond to them, well, do you realize it was written at a sixth grade level? What what was your level in school? I don't mean to put them down, but what's so hard to understand about being thou? And just like anything, if you come across a word you don't understand, you look it up in a dictionary. We have the possibility today with technology just to click on a link under Strong's Concordance. Every word is explained in its original. And you can go and weigh it, look at it. So there's no reason why we can't have and understand at least of the words of Scripture. I understand that it's the Spirit of God that has to teach us, give us eyes to see Christ. Because some of the best linguists of the day were the Pharisees and the scribes. That was their job. When they copied by hand the original scriptures, they went back and counted all the little, what they call the the yodas and the the jots and the tittles. Because one little mark over a word can make a difference in the entire word. That's in the original. So they were careful. They went back and counted every word to make sure it was transcribed. And I believe the Lord purposed that for us, to preserve his word, even through these men that were anti-Christ. And yet, they missed Christ. Our Lord Jesus said of them in John 5, 39, ye search the scriptures. He's talking about their carefulness in copying and studying the scriptures. And he said, because ye think that in them ye have eternal life. It's like many today, they're Bible toters. They hold this Bible and they hold it to be the inspired word of God. And they will 
tell you, oh yeah, I'm a Bible believer. The problem is they don't believe in the God of the Bible. Just like the Pharisees. Who's the God of the Bible other than Christ from begin to end? It's not just the nebulous God, but it's the Lord Jesus Christ. If God has ever been revealed in a sinner in truth from the Old Testament all the way to our time to the end of time, it has been through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those of the Old Testament, the Spirit caused them to look forward. It's like Job declared, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and in the last day shall stand on the earth. What day was he talking about? He was talking about his first coming. The Redeemer, God. There's none that redeems but God, but standing in the earth in the last day. How do we know it's the last day? Because it was inaugurated when God became flesh, came to this earth, lived out that perfect life of obedience as a substitute, and laid down his life that God might be just to justify. So as we read the Old Testament, what a blessed way to read it. Looking for Christ, because that's where Solomon was caused by the Spirit of God to look. You talk about a sinner. Go back and look at his life. There was nothing in Solomon. If salvation were by works, there, there would be no hope. But he was caused in his seeking even of wisdom, to know wisdom. He said, well, why would you need to seek Solomon? God already gave you that wisdom and told you that you would be the wisest man on this earth. Yeah, but there's natural wisdom, and then there's the wisdom of Christ. And I believe that's what Proverbs is about. I believe that's what Ecclesiastes is about. The name Ecclesiastes means the preacher. And there's one thing when you read Ecclesiastes that Solomon is confessing is there's no hope in this flesh. We labor, we enjoy the fruit of our hands, but there's something more that's necessary. And that's something more surprising. Then you get into Song of Solomon, where he describes that relationship between the king and that that servant woman is a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and his love for his people. So what is the difference between wisdom, knowledge, and understanding? It's said that knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. But wisdom and understanding is not mixing it in with the fruit salad. I like that little definition. What are you going to do with that knowledge that a tomato is a fruit? Well, try mixing it in with the fruit salad sometime, and you'll find people going like, ooh, what's a tomato doing here? That's, that's wisdom, understanding, not putting it in there with it. Now, uh, having said that, some of you may like tomatoes in your fruit salad. I don't know. But the problem with defining words, just like we have here, is that they can mean different things or the same thing, depending on the context. The right interpretation of scripture is always in its context, just like in a dictionary. You have a primary meaning, and then you have a secondary, and then you have another third, sometimes fourth, depending on the context. It's like people that say to me, well, world means world. Really? Look that word up in the... Bible concordance, and you'll find out there's four different meanings for world, depending on the context. So when it says God so loved the world, it doesn't mean that he loved every single individual in the world, but he loved this created world in this manner, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe on him. So right there it tells you it wasn't everybody, because not everybody believes Whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So even there, it makes a distinction between the believing world and the unbelieving. And it's not all that are believers. It's not all that profess to believe that are believers. So you, there it is. The word world, the word all, same thing. There's a context to it in its meaning. And the same here with these words. Now, wisdom, I don't know if, you like to do like I do, but where I see repeated words, I like to highlight them in my Bible and draw a little bridge to those words. Three times this word wisdom is used here in our text. Verse 2, 
to know wisdom. In verse 3, to receive the instruction of wisdom. And then down in verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom. Now here's where it's helpful with your little Strong's Concordance. If you look it up on your device and click on these different words, you'll notice that actually for the word wisdom in the original, there are two different Hebrew words that are used. Verses 2 and 7 have the same word. And it has to do, it's an interesting word, it has to do with the skill of an artificer, of an artisan, somebody that takes something and makes something out of it. And as you observe what is made, you can see the skill. That's the word here for wisdom, the skill in how it was made. For example, over in Exodus chapter 28 and verse 3, if you look there with me, this was how the priest's garments were to be made. When you think about every piece of furniture of that tabernacle that was made, they didn't just go out and find just anybody or do a call of artists to put together something here and then pick the best one. No, even that was to be done according to the Spirit's direction. Why was it important? Why did the Lord say to Moses to make sure that every detail of the tabernacle, I don't know how long it's been since you've studied the tabernacle, but there's my new shot. Right on down to the colors of the threads and the curtains and the fabric and all of these things. Why was it so necessary that it all be done according to what God dictated? Because it's a picture of God's Son. If I put out a call for somebody to paint a picture of my son that I wanted to honor, I would want to make sure that right on down to the freckles on the face, everything was according to how it would reflect on my son for his glory. And that's what these are in the Old Testament. How many times have people study through the tabernacle like, well, this is part of the law, and let's just go through this, da 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 Every detail is a picture of God's Son. Right on down to the priest's robes here, when it says there, and this instruction was given to Aaron and to his sons. For the priest's office, thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother. Notice what it says there, for glory and for beauty. Why? Because even that garment is a picture of the robe of righteousness that the Lord Jesus Christ would come and work out to the honor and glory. And it's described here for glory and for beauty. You could preach an entire message just on those two words. The glory and beauty. When we sing fairest Lord Jesus, the glory and beauty of God's Son it's not to become enthralled with those garments like we have today. People going back and they're actually rebuilding models of the tabernacle. They've got people dressed up walking around in these robes and the whole thing is historic. Well, this is how it, it would have looked like for a priest in that day and everybody's like, oh, this is cool. It becomes a tourist attraction. That has nothing to do with it. This has to do with Christ. And look at verse three. Thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted where does that wisdom come but through the Spirit of God? Because it says, whom I have filled with the Spirit of wisdom. If a person was filled with the Spirit of wisdom, it's not just natural talent wisdom here. I believe that these would have been the true Israel among Israel. These would have been those in whom the Spirit of Christ dwelt. And so as they were doing it, it wasn't just doing a fabric, but their thoughts were upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who he was and what this would represent. That's, as I said, when God is pleased to reveal of himself to any sinner, it's going to be through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know I get pushback. People say, oh, well, they didn't know all that we know today about Christ. I'll tell you what, if the spirit of wisdom was in them, then their hope is even as Christ said of Abraham, he saw my day and rejoiced. Maybe they didn't have all the detail that was going to be in Bethlehem and 
his name would be called Jesus. But like Job, Job was one of the oldest writers in Scripture. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Just as Boaz was a kinsman Redeemer. Picture the Ruth of what Christ would be, that seed of David that should come from that lineage. But there it is, the spirit of wisdom. That's the same word we have here in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 2 and 7. That they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And there's another whole message too, how Aaron in that high priestly office was a type and picture of what the Lord Jesus Christ would be. So that's the same word. That's the skill of an artificer. But you come back here to Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 6, where it says to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise or the wise one and their dark saying. That's a different word. That means to be prudent and circumspect and to give a careful attention to detail. When you find somebody that we would consider to be a genius, we know some people, I'm not one, but there are those that they see things from a different perspective and they're constantly bringing out aspects that you never thought of. Your first reaction is, how did you see that and that? That's what it is to be a wise one. Prudent and circumspect. And that's why when I was reading, I said the words of the wise one. That's Christ. Think of him coming to this earth. And his one mission is the satisfaction of God the Father on behalf of that people that the Father had given him and that the strict justice of God required that not just in word and deed, but thought every aspect of the law be fulfilled and accomplished for him to say it is finished. I don't know about you, but there's been times where you finish the project, you finish something, you turn it into your boss or it was like me turning my paperwork into the teacher. They're always going to find something. It's good, but, you know, and if, have you seen this, but? And you're like, ah, man. If, never, if that's that way with men, imagine what it is with a holy God. And yet, when the Lord Jesus had finished the work and said, it is finished, there was not one thing that a holy God, his Father, could look upon and say, ah, but you overlooked this. That's wisdom. In fact, if you look over in Isaiah chapter 53, you see, this is an important point here because there are those that say, well, these are the Old Testament. They were justified before God, even before Christ came. Well, you go against what the scriptures teach. Yes, God purposed the justification of sinners from eternity, but when was it worked out? When was it accomplished? It certainly wasn't accomplished in the types and pictures. Those animal sacrifices couldn't put away sin. Those priests, even in their role, they continued to be but men. And that's why they died. And it was transitioned from them to somebody else. That's why the sacrifices had to continue to be offered because they could never put away sin. If those in the Old Testament had already been justified because God decreed it in eternity, as some are saying, then what's the purpose for all of the detail? Well, the reality is that they lived under the forbearance of God. That's the word that Paul uses in Romans chapter 3. God was forbearing with their sin, not imputing to them their sin. Why? Because he purposed to charge it to his son when his son would come, live and die and rise again. So the working out of this salvation is what is so vital. And here in Isaiah chapter 53, look how it's written in verse 11. He, and in the context, this would be God, the Father, shall see the travail of his soul, the travail of Christ's soul. Now you think about a soul. That's a human 
term. Christ did not have a soul before he was conceived in that womb. A soul is a human term. He was made a man. He became flesh. But why? Because it was necessary that his soul should be made an offering for sin. So it wasn't just the physical offering, which was necessary. The reason he had to have a body was because only a man could die. God can't die. So his body, a body has thou prepared for me, is that sacrifice. But the sin bearing, you think about what sin is. It's the transgression of the soul. It's not just what we do. It's who we are. And our Lord Jesus Christ suffered the guilt. He didn't become a sinner. There wasn't sin put in him. Here Isaiah says that the chastisement of our peace was upon him. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's like in the Old Testament by those high priests putting their hand on that blameless lamb did not make the lamb now sinful. There was a transference of guilt that that lamb should die in the place of those that the lamb represented. So he shall see the travail of his soul in verse 11. God the Father see the travail of the soul and shall be satisfied. There was satisfaction to be had by a holy God. Now here's the good news for any for whom Christ paid the debt because when he finished the work, it was finished. That's good news to a sinner. If in any part this depended upon me to a complete, like you hear people preaching today, well, Christ laid the down payment. And now it's up to you to finish it. You have to do this, or you have to do that. Thankfully, it's not so. Even if the Lord would say, I've done everything I can, now it's up to you to believe. There would be no salvation because none of us are born with faith in our souls. That's a gift to God. But look at here. By his, there's the word, knowledge, by his prudence, by his circumspect life, by him giving careful attention to every detail in all things, notice what it says. This is God the Father speaking now. Shall my righteous servant justify many? Why is it put in the future tense? If they were already justified, all you would read there is, shall my righteous servant affirm what I've already decreed, that they're already justified. That's not what the scriptures say shall justify many. Who are the many? Those that the Father gave. I love the, the shalls of Scripture. I've told you that before. When people say, are you a hard shell? Like S-H-E-L-L, -L, I tell them, no, I'm a hard shall. S-H-A-L-L. -L. I don't mind that. I'll tell you, the grace of God softens this old heart. <laughs> but it's based upon the hard shall. S-H-A-L-L, -L, of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He shall bear their iniquities. I'll tell you what, if he bore them, then we bear them no more. And I'll tell you, there's a bunch of people out there mocking right now with the internet. Anything you preach is automatically public, and they like to take and just pick your words apart. And there's a bunch of people mocking out there the what the Lord has made precious to my own soul, and that is when I was born in this world, though a sinner, I was born a justified sinner. I just didn't know about it. Where was I justified? When Christ finished the work. God purposed it in eternity, but if I believe the scripture, shall my righteous servant justify many because he shall bear their iniquities? Where were the iniquities born away? At the cross. What remained then for God now to do but to declare righteous everyone for whom Christ paid the debt? I know that might kind of stir your own heart a little bit if you've never seen it that way, but if we weren't justified at the cross, then we've never been justified. Don't think it's when you believe that God justifies or looks at 
you and says, okay, now I justify you, now I justify you, as if there were multiple justifications. Scripture speaks of one. By his knowledge, by that working out of salvation, shall my righteous servant justify many. When was it worked out? When he said it is finished. And he commended his spirit to his father. That's, that's good news. But that's the wisdom of God. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What's the knowledge? Coming back here to Proverbs chapter 1. Twice we see this in our text in verse 4 and verse 7. Where it says to give subtlety to the simple. That word subtlety means prudence to the simple-minded. I'll tell you, that's what we are as sinners. Nothing but simple simpletons. There's nothing in us. We're ignorant. Fools without the spirit of Christ. But... When the Spirit of Christ is pleased to reveal him in us, it is through the instruction, as it says in verse 3, of wisdom, the instruction of Christ, that we see justice and judgment and equity. Those three words are similar. We see righteousness worked out on behalf of ignorant, foolish, wretched sinners that we are to give subtlety to the simple. And it says to the young man, and the reason he uses young man is because you're thinking of someone that's not really mature. And they need guidance. That's any one of us. In fact, the scriptures say that unless we become as little children and are converted, we'll not see the kingdom of God. We won't perceive it. We can't enter in until the grace of God humbles us. When Peter writes there as newborn babes desire the sincere mouth of the word, don't think of yourself as anything but a newborn babe. It's just an example. We never get over being newborn babes desiring the sincere mouth of the word. But there's a bunch of people looking at that and think, oh, that's what I was when I was first born again. And now, well, what are you now? What's your desire? If it's anything but the sincere mouth of the word, then you've never been converted. So the young man, to that young man, it says knowledge and discernment. You could say knowledge, even discernment. That's what knowledge is. It's not just an accumulation of facts. There's a bunch of people that have an accumulation of facts about Christ. They can tell you right down the line. You ask him, was he God? Yep. Did he live a perfect life on this earth? Yep. Did he lay down his life to die for sinners? Yep. Did he rise again? Yep. Did he ascend on high? Yep. Is he coming again? Yep. You realize you can believe all that and still not believe any more than the devil? Because the devil knows it. He knows it. So it's not just an accumulation of facts or of true sayings that constitute knowledge. I believe here again, when we read the scriptures in their context, the one describes the other, knowledge and discretion. That's where we get to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 concerning the gospel, how that Christ died according to the scriptures. It's not just that he died, and not how he was buried and was raised again according to the scriptures. There's meaning behind his death, who he is and why he died and what he accomplished by his death that pertains to sinners such as we are. That's not just, oh, I know that, but it, that the spirit of Christ being revealed in us, now as we just sang it to begin with, complete in thee, no work of mine, can satisfy the Lord God other than that bloodshed. So knowledge is to have perception and discernment. I know that's the way it is in your heart. You may not know everything there is to know about Christ. I certainly don't. But when I mention his name, the spirit brings to light in your heart all the beauty and glory of his person and work. It melts your heart. You can't 
rejoice in someone you don't know. I, we've all been caught up in those conversations. You get together with somebody and somebody will say, well, let me show you the picture of our new baby. Totally unrelated to you. And, and you know how it is. Oh, so sweet. Looks so beautiful. You're, you're happy for them, but it's not like, what's, what do you do when you, when you, uh, when they get talking and say, here, let me show you a picture of my pride and joy. You start digging around for that one that is related to you. I'll tell you, when I hear the world talking about their little Jesus out there, I can't relate. Can't even rejoice in it. But let me tell you about this one that God has graciously made precious to my heart, of whom this all of these scriptures reveal concern his person. Where does that knowledge originate? It comes from the Spirit of God, the same spirit of wisdom that was put in those artificers to do that work, that very spirit of Christ, by his knowledge, by his perception, shall my righteous servant justify many. Anything I know of salvation is going to be in, in him. So that's what the word knowledge is. It's, it's the discretion, everything about him that directs us in our thinking is due to him. And then Verses uh, 2, 5, and 6, you've got that word understanding. Understanding. Three times it's used here. Understanding is the ability by God's grace to take that knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ as revealed by the Spirit of God and live accordingly. We don't live by rules and regulations and ceremonies. I know people that don't know Christ, they always come back with that. Well, then how on earth are people going to know how to live if you don't preach standards? I preach the standard. And I'll tell you, where the spirit of Christ is in a sinner, you don't have to chain him down with rules and regulations and laws, touch not, taste not, handle not. The spirit's going to direct him. When the Lord directed Philip to that Ethiopian eunuch out there in the desert and pointed him to Christ, you read anywhere where Philip said, now that you're baptized, you need to follow these rules and regulations. I have a little script here, and these are the things I want you to do and say. None of that. He turned them loose. We don't hear anything more of it, other than today there are, are roots of Christendom that go back to Ethiopia. You can study and read about it. Of course, it's all become perverted in all kinds of other ceremony, but somewhere... Back in time, and according to the book of Acts, is when that Ethiopian eunuch took the gospel back to Ethiopia. But as he began to talk to those around him, the Lord raised up a church that worshiped God in truth for a while. But just like anything, it has a life and a death according to God's purpose. So that's the wisdom, the knowledge, and understanding that all pertain to Christ. And I will tell you that none have wisdom, but have that wisdom in Christ. None have wisdom, but have that knowledge, that, that discernment concerning who he is, and what he accomplished, and why he did it, and where he is now. And the understanding, that understanding that directs, that, that word understanding is the ability to comprehend, apprehend, as the Spirit teaches us all the beauty and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And with that, we go forth and we live. So I told you we might not get all the way through it. So we'll come back to it next time, the Lord willing. I pray the Lord will bless what we've heard in this hour. We'll meet back here in a few minutes.